You are listening to Supplement Source, the official podcast of the Council for Responsible Nutrition. And now, your host, Jeff Ventura. Hello, and thank you for tuning in to another episode of Supplement Source. I'm Jeff Ventura, the Vice President of Communications here at the Council for Responsible Nutrition. I'm so excited today to be talking about an announcement that we put out this morning uh, about the Vitamin and Mineral Safety Handbook. And if you don't know what that is, you're in luck because I have two folks with us today uh, who are more than happy to explain. Joining me first uh, up is Andrea Wong. She's the Senior Vice President of Science and Regulatory Affairs here at CRN. Hello, Andrea. Hi, Jeff. Nice of you to join us this morning. Thanks for having me. Uh, Also uh, very generous with his time is Andrew Shao, who's the Senior Vice President of Global Scientific and Regulatory Affairs at Chromadex. How are you today, Andrew? Doing very well. Great to be with both of you today. Um, th- uh, thank you so much, Andrew, for having uh, having uh, taken the time today to come on and talk to us a little bit about this. I know that you know a bit about the history of this. For folks who are either new to the industry or um, you know, or maybe you know, in the industry, but not specifically in this sort of line of line of sight. Tell me a little bit about where did this handbook start? Sure, sure. Uh, happy to do that. It really starts with the the person who brought the foundational, I guess, principles to the industry, to the nutrition research community. That's John Hathcock, uh, one of my mentors, certainly a mentor for for many folks. And it was really his his thinking that served as the basis for this for this handbook. And it's not just a book; it's it's a it's a way of thinking. It's uh, based on really two foundational principles. One is that vitamins and minerals inherently have a wide margin of safety. And two is that wherever possible, it's better to base intake uh, limits, uh, upper levels, safety on human data Mm -hmm. rather than extrapolating from animal data, which is really, it's really those two fundamental principles uh, that John brought to the table in an effort to combat what we call the precautionary principle, which is a de- default, very conservative approach to vitamins and minerals, almost as if they were drugs and right. carried uh, inherent risk when they really didn't. And so going back in, uh, to the 90s, the mid 90s, when he first started to bring this thinking to the table and develop that first draft of the, uh, of the safety handbook, is putting his thinking down into paper, on paper, that could then be shared and socialized with the broader uh, nutrition research community, uh, risk assessment community, with regulators and policymakers. And the thinking at the time was really to try to influence Codex and the EU, where the precautionary principle, this very conservative approach to vitamin minerals was born and starting to influence uh, other markets and really put unnecessary limits on vitamins and minerals in supplements, in food supplements. Well, and you still um, see and that. You still see that today, even anecdotally in a lot of the... I, I talk to uh, members of the media a lot, uh, and oftentimes they are equating, you know, sort of the dosing around drugs with... The, the, it's their only sort of, you know, example or template in their minds. So when they're talking about vitamins and minerals, they're, you know, they, they sort of are trying to apply the same architecture of their understanding on how drugs work and you know we have to say to them listen these are not prescription drugs Um, they have a very different effect on the body yeah and i think some of that is driven by the fact that they come in the same form the same Mm. sort of delivery form and so without uh, knowing any better without being properly informed stakeholders can default to what it comes in the same form so we must take the same very overly conservative approach. Right. You know, John spent most of his career battling that. And that battle was encompassed in this book, this vitamin and mineral safety handbook. It was all in there Mm -hmm. uh, and used historically to engage, mainly to engage in dialogue, but also to try to shape the thinking in regions around the world, which is really exactly what it did from the the EU to the ASEAN. 
Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. What at what stage did you get involved in that, Andrew? It sounds like you you were there fairly early on. So I got involved in the mid two thousands, and mm-hmm. I think correct me if I'm wrong, Andrew. The the, the first iteration of the um, handbook was in the was it the late nineties? I got involved in mid two thousands, where the 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 handbook and everything that went into it mm-hmm. was basically on on the road. John was on the road at Codex, uh, at uh, ASEAN meetings, and even in Asia, uh, other parts of Asia, South America as well, trying to educate regulators and policymakers, nutrition scientists about this approach to being less conservative. Mm-hmm. but still science-based and risk-based, which is what all this is. This is all risk assessment. Mm-hmm. And I, I was fortunate enough to be uh, under his wing starting around 2005 when I joined CRN. Mm-hmm. Um, and he and I worked very closely together on other publications that were born mm-hmm. out of the principles that he put and some of the information he put in the early versions of the Biotech and Mineral Safety when, Handbook. When you first came to CRN, Andrea, was the the handbook something you had heard of, or um, you know, did did you already recognize it as as credible, or did it gain credibility over the years since you've been here? Can you, can you talk a little bit about that? So, so that's a very interesting question because. At the time I joined CRN, I was really unaware of who CRN was uh-huh. and what, what, what CRN's role was, what even a trade association's job was. I had no knowledge or context around the DC scene, but I did know about that handbook. Huh. And I knew about it because we used it, we relied on it heavily when I worked at GNC as a guide to formulate our products because we wanted to make sure we could push the envelope but still be science-based and still provide safe products. And so we used it as a very, very important guide in developing new product formulations to make sure that we stayed within the limits that were outlined in the handbook. And so I do very well of it, well before I joined CRM. I realize that your names are yeah. very similar uh, you know, when you say Andrew and Andrea, so I also <laughs> want to ask Andrea that question too. I'm glad I'm asking both of you that same question. So. Andrea, um, tell me also, like, what was your familiarity? I mean, did you share in this this recognition of it that that Andrew's talked about? I was not as familiar with it as Andrew was. I came from the consulting world, but I will say that I did utilize some of the publications that Andrew co-authored with John um, that were based on the same principles as what we see in the handbook. So, Andrew, your papers on Luchi and zeaxanthin, for example, were ones that industry has used so much, um, as well as other stakeholders. And I came on board just as John was completing the third iteration of the handbook. And that was one of my first projects here at CRN was to go through the chapters and edit them and check the references. So it was really uh, a great memory for me and an opportunity for me to work with John um, after he had already retired from his full-time role at CRN. But I learned a lot from him in that short period of time. Mm. What what would the field be without it today, given where the industry is today? And well, from, Andrew, yeah. from my mm-hmm. yeah, from my standpoint, Jeff, I I mean, I think, look, I think the handbook represented a tool for having dialogue based on common ground. Mm-hmm. Okay, because responsible industry, regulators, policymakers, all want to put consumer safety first. And we want uh, values we come up with to be Mm science-based. So there's the common ground. And what the handbook was and its principles served as a tool to engage based on that. Mm -hmm. Without engagement, you can't can't fill the gap uh, between, well, we think these levels are, are, are appropriate, but the other side thinks those levels are appropriate. We fill the gap by engaging, and we use the the handbook and its principles as the tool to facilitate that. So I really think that's what that represented. So without that, you would not have the basis to convene and engage over what everyone agrees is a science-based approach 
we would probably still have these big gaps and be fighting these battles much more so. I mean, it is an ongoing thing, but the progress that John was able to make uh, using this handbook and others as well following in his footsteps has been tremendous. Had it not been in place, we would be probably facing a much, much steeper uphill battle. Which, issue. which, and I'm looking at Andrea now, which gets to the issue of funding this project, of updating these chapters. I mean, it, it, it's you know, probably more important than ever that um, these chapters uh, get updated like the three chapters that we've announced today have been updated, right? Right. And sadly, we don't have John's expertise anymore. We lost him several years ago. And we want to carry on that legacy to make sure that the science drives the, you know, policy and the upper levels that are set by government agencies where possible. And so to be able to complete this project is a huge undertaking. And so we've turned to uh, a third party, talk strategies to help us use the methodolo methodology that John had established and update the chapters. Um, it's been 10 years since the last time we've had the chapters um, updated. And obviously, science has evolved since then. And so we're looking at a huge volume of literature that has to be identified and screened and then evaluated and then included in the handbook. And so that takes time and it takes resources. And so we're looking for um, funding from our members and from the broader industry to help us update all of these chapters. And also, we're including some new ones. So we had 28 chapters in the handbook covering vitamins, minerals, and trace elements. And now we're looking at additional ones like lutein and zeaxanthin, choline, for example, are ones that are very commonly used dietary ingredients. And people are looking for information to help inform their product development and also to help, like Andrew mentioned, with international regulatory uh, authorities. Mm -hmm. And what what do you say to those folks who, because I know, uh, maybe I'm wrong, um, but one of the levels that didn't change, right, from from the, the last time you looked at it. And so what do you say to those folks who say, well, you know, this project, is it worth it? Because the levels didn't change. Like, um, w what would you say to that, to that criticism? Well, we're confirming the yeah. safety of the levels that were established back in 2014. So what um, Talk Strategies has done is gone through the literature in a systematic way and filtered it out and chosen the most relevant studies looking at human clinical, stud clinical trial data where available and analyzing the data to make sure that, you know, these numbers are still valid. And so for these first three chapters that we've covered, uh, vitamin B6, vitamin E, and zinc, they looked through the literature in the last 10 years and were able to confirm that the levels that we had set back in 2014 are all still valid and they're current. Uh, really a testament to the to the methodology and the, the legacy uh, that was left behind in terms of this project, I think. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Andrew, what are we forgetting to talk about that you that you want to talk about as we as we well, sort of come up on the time? Sure, sure. I very, very quickly, I just think that this is a, a an ongoing effort. Mm -hmm. You know, if we don't continue to be vigilant, what we're seeing is these principles, this approach that were was instilled uh, years ago is now starting to erode. Mm. And we stand to lose out, lose a lot of ground on these upper levels to the back to this conservative thinking if we don't stay vigilant and continuing to engage using this science-based approach. If we just sit back and do nothing, we're going to find ourselves uh, in a situation where these upper levels have been uh, reduced and cut back without having a say. So it's very critical that we stay engaged and that uh, the industry and companies support this effort. I swear, it's an I'm ongoing not, effort. I swear, I'm not playing a sound effect of a of a siren to sort of <laughs> underscore the importance. But this is Washington D.C., so we of we really course, have we really, we really have no say in in the sound effects outside. That's right. Yeah, and uh, and we are seeing it, Andrew. To highlight what you said, yeah. we're seeing it with the European Union, EFSA's most recent opinions and evaluations on uh, nutrients like vitamin B6. We've maintained, for us, we maintained the um, upper level at 100 milligrams, and for mm -hmm. EFSA, it went down to 12. That's a huge difference. Yes. 
based on their approach. That's a wake up call. It's a huge wake up call. That should be a wake up call. That should be a wake up call for all of us. Yeah. Wow. Well, I think that's a great point to end on. Nothing underscores the importance more, I think, than that. Thank you so much, Andrew Shao and uh, Andrea Wong, for coming on Supplement Source today. We really appreciate your insights. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Jeff. Andrea. Good to be here. Yep.